we are going to pivot to uh, language recovery in the early period. And I'm uh, going to introduce Dr. R.G. Hillis. Uh, R.G. Hillis is a professor of neurology, physical medicine, and rehabilitation, and cognitive science at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. She serves as the executive vice chair of neurology, the director of the cerebrovascular division, and the director of the Center of Excellence in Stroke Detection and Treatment with the Sheikh Khalifa Stroke Institute. She began her career as a speech language pathologist and director of neurological rehabilitation, focusing on studies of novel treatments of aphasia and communication disorders after right hemisphere stroke. She also studied cognitive neuropsychology in the cognitive science department at Johns Hopkins, where she later became a family, faculty member. Her research focused on identifying the cognitive processes underlying language and spatial representations through the study of aphasia and hemispatial neglect and how these investigations might help focus rehabilitation. Dr. Hillis then completed medical training and neurology residency at Johns Hopkins and integrated her training in the fields of speech language pathology and cognitive science with neurology to continue her investigations of aphasia and right hemisphere cognitive and communicative impairments and how they recover. Her research combines longitudinal task-related and task-free functional imaging and novel methods of structural imaging with detailed cognitive and language assessments to reveal the dynamic neural networks that underlie language and cognitive functions such as empathy and prosody. Her lab studies uh, change from the acute stage of stroke through the first year of recovery to improve our understanding of how language and other cognitive functions recover after stroke and how to facilitate that recovery. She also conducts randomized clinical trials of medications and non-invasive brain stimulation to augment language rehabilitation. And as a uh, faculty member in her department, I can tell you she's an outstanding leader, a wonderful mentor, and just an all around uh, adventurous and superhuman to work with on the daily. So with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, play Dr. Hillis's talk. Uh, she's here live and we'll be answering questions. So please go ahead and put those into the Q&A box as we go. Uh, Dr. Hillis, to your talk. Good afternoon. I'm R.G. Hillis, and in this picture, you see some members of the Stroke Cognitive Outcomes and Recovery, or SCORE Lab at Hopkins. And they are my postdoctoral fellows and research assistants and speech language pathologists who work with me, who have done a lot of the work I'll be talking about. So I want to show that intervention for language deficits after stroke really depends on the time post onset, that there are different mechanisms of recovery that need to be enhanced at different stages of recovery. I'll also describe innovative language interventions, especially behavioral therapies for post-stroke aphasia, um, and, as well as some that have been used for primary progressive aphasia caused by neurodegenerative disease and describe ways to enhance aphasia recovery by augmenting language therapy in after stroke using transcranial direct current stimulation and transcranial magnetic stimulation using medications. So after stroke, there are a number of ways the brain can recover function. Um, one of these is through tissue reperfusion, um, which takes uh, place usually in the acute stage. That is, we can restore blood flow, and you've heard more about that in, uh, in other sessions, in the first few hours or even days after stroke when there remains salvageable tissue that is, has not gone on to infarct but is causing some deficits. Um, and then weeks to years after stroke is reorganization of structure function relationships. That is, uh, healthy parts of the brain can take over for the unhealthy, uh, the damaged parts of the brain in terms of recovering language. And language really depends on a network of areas. And sometimes there's changes in how the, the various areas of the brain connect together or work together. And this can be imaged with functional connectivity. And I'll show you some examples. Um, and then even years post-stroke, uh, months to years, people can recover language or communication through use of compensatory strategies or learning new ways to, to get at old information. And I'll talk about those things. 
So in terms of uh, changes in blood flow, um, the, as I mentioned, the exciting thing about being a stroke neurologist these days is that we have a number of ways to restore blood flow to the brain through intravenous and intraarterial thrombolysis or combination. Thrombectomy is probably the mainstay of treatment that really improves function and uh, limits the amount of damage in stroke. Angioplasty and stenting are sometimes done when there's critical stenosis of large vessels to the brain, sometimes even uh, surgical revascularization through uh, carotid endarterectomy, for example, can restore blood flow even acutely and sometimes improve function as well as reduce the risk of recurrent stroke. And then a, a final one that we have used and, and we ran a, a, a randomized clinical trial some years ago uh, for is induced blood pressure elevation. And, and this is a temporary measure done only in acute stroke in very selective patients who have large vessel stenosis um, and a large area of salvageable but dysfunctional tissue. And animal studies in the 70s showed in this kind of setting, there, the ischemic but not infarcted tissue um, it, there's a, a loss of autoregulation so that increasing the mean arterial blood pressure in that area can actually increase the regional cerebral blood flow and can restore function um, at least until the person can develop their own collateral circulation through other vessels um, and so on. So this is just an example of one of our early patients who had an infarct and in all my um, imaging pictures, the left hemisphere is on the right side of the brain. And the patient at the same time had a larger area of poor perfusion shown in blue here beyond the infarct. And this is an area known as Wernicke's area and is very important for the meanings of words for both word comprehension and naming. And we increased his mean arterial blood pressure shown on the dotted line um, using pressors. And then when we did that, both naming and word comprehension and sentence comprehension improved. When we stopped the intervention, the mean arterial blood pressure uh, deteriorated or declined again, and those functions deteriorated, and they improved again when we increased his uh, mean arterial pressure again. And this is days after stroke. That we started a week after stroke. So sometimes there's dysfunctional but salvageable tissue that can be uh recovered and the function can be, can be restored by increasing blood flow to that area. This is another person who had a huge area of poor perfusion, but very tiny infarct in the left temporal lobe at day one. And we were able to restore blood flow to that area by day three. And we see that his, his word picture matching performance, a test of comprehension, uh, word comprehension improved from 50% to 90% by restoring blood flow to that area. This is another patient um, who had a very small infarct. We've seen it in an outside hospital and we were called for transfer of the patient because he was getting worse and he had a global aphasia, and that means very severe language deficits. He couldn't understand or say anything. And he had uh, right-sided weakness, and they didn't have perfusion-weighted imaging to see if there were areas of low blood flow, but we would imagine that there was this tiny stroke the dot here on diffusion-weighted imaging cannot explain his deficit. So if you just had this scan, you'd say he had what's called a diffusion clinical mismatch. And that means there's opportunity to restore blood flow to improve function. 
When he got to our hospital, he still just had this tiny infarct on diffusion weighted imaging. This is actually the image from our hospital. And he had at the same time, a huge area of poor perfusion of the whole left internal carotid artery territory. He underwent an urgent carotid endarterectomy on a Saturday and he restored blood flow to the whole internal carotid artery distribution and his word comprehension also improved from chance level to 100% and all of his language functions recovered and his weakness recovered and he was able to go back to work um, the next week after being uh, severely aphasic and write him a plegic for three days. Um, this patient likewise had a very large area of poor perfusion, um, and but a very small infarct, which isn't shown here due to critical narrowing of the left internal carotid artery. She also had some narrowing of the middle cerebral artery more distally, but we were able to urgently put in a stent here, and you can see there's a good angiographic result. We, um, the stenting improved her blood flow, it didn't make it completely normal because she still had a second lesion, and her word comprehension improved from 70% to 90% correct. Now, it's not just that people improve spontaneously um, if they have a large area of poor perfusion. In fact, this is a patient who has a tiny infarct in the left temporal lobe, a larger area of poor perfusion. We were not able to restore blood flow in his case, and he did not recover. In fact, he had a larger area of high poor perfusion by day three, and he showed somewhat of a decline in language performance. Now, sometimes we can restore blood flow even in the subacute period, weeks after onset of symptoms in very selective cases. So this is a patient who had a tiny infarct and poor perfusion of the cortex um, of the internal carotid artery uh, territory on both sides. She had a condition known as Moya Moya syndrome. And the treatment for Moya Moya syndrome is really to restore blood flow, but slowly by uh, something called encephalodural myosin angiosis um, or, or EDAMS, um, where they, the surgeon takes part of the temporalis muscle and implants it under the dora. Um, and it takes weeks for this to really help, but that, that muscle is still, uh, still has its arterial supply and ischemic tissue tends to attract blood vessels. So it, uh, new vessels to grow from that muscle flap into the cortex. And that's what's happened here. And this, we see reperfusion of most of the left hemisphere cortex a little bit in the posterior temporal lobe is still poorly perfused. Um, and after this procedure, her picture naming improved from 0% to 76% correct. She still had that, that small area of poor perfusion in posterior temporal lobe that can account for her residual naming impairment. But naming to pictures at, or naming objects after tactile exploration improved from 47% to 100%. When she had had bilateral poor perfusion, she actually had a visual agnosia, so was also unable to recognize pictures, but could do better if she was able to hold on to the object. Um, her written word comprehension also improved from 0% to 71%. And you can see these new vessels growing in from this muscle flap to restore blood flow to the brain. And, and this is a typical picture of Moya Moya where she had carotid occlusion. You see no MCA, um, territory, MCA vessels at all on the left, but they often have this neovascularization, these tiny vessels that perfuse the um, uh, subcortical structures. Another woman I saw in the subacute period who benefited from restoring blood flow was a woman who had had an endarterectomy 
um, two years previously and developed some fluctuating aphasia for a couple of weeks. Um, her vascular surgeon called and asked me if I could give her an urgent outpatient appointment. I called and talked to her and she already sounded aphasic to me. She wasn't talking very well. She was struggling to think of words. And she said, well, I'm, I'm much worse after I uh, eat. Um, and so I asked her to come in urgently and we were we set up for her to have diffusion perfusion imaging. And she had not had a stroke yet. Um, she had a perfectly normal diffusion weighted image. Um, but she did have poor perfusion of the left temporal lobe in the language areas of the brain. Um, and she had a uh, critical stenosis of the left internal carotid artery. Since she had already had one endarterectomy, we put in a stent immediately and she, her perfusion was completely restored and her symptoms resolved after the stent and never came back. Now she was getting worse after each meal because we think she had either splanchnic steel syndrome where the, the gut kind of steals some of the blood flow um, and you get less blood flow through the critical stenosis or it could have been steel from the external carotid artery while she was chewing. Um, this is another patient who had uh, in this case, thrombolysis. Um, on day one, he had poor perfusion of this posterior temporal area, critical for naming, but a uh, tiny little infarct. His naming improved um, or was poor at day one before we restored blood flow. His comprehension was okay because he actually spared Wernicke's area. Um, but when we restored blood flow to this area, he improved in naming and also reading, um, where his comprehension remained unchanged. And this is the same thing that happened with a patient who had poor perfusion in this posterior temporal area on day one. She couldn't name or write words, severely anomic, but normal comprehension. And we restored blood flow to this area just by increasing her mean arterial blood pressure from 80 to 101, in this case, just using uh, fluids, IV fluids. And the same thing happened with this gentleman who had poor perfusion of this area um, in the posterior temporal lobe. So we increased his mean arterial pressure with fluids um, just to a normal level. Um, his naming improved when we, we let his blood pressure drop after stopping IV fluids, his naming deteriorated and improved again when we restored uh, blood flow again through by increasing his mean arterial pressure to normal. And he, um, all of these patients, we, we don't keep on treatment, either IV fluids or other medications, um, forever, but we slowly wean them off using oral medications if necessary um, until they, re they recover blood flow on their own. Um, now, we know that in subacute stroke, as I mentioned, there's often reorganization of structure function relationships. That is, we recruit undamaged regions of the left or the right hemisphere into language networks. And we know this because many patients with very large left hemisphere strokes like this one um, recover and they, they probably aren't using much of the left hemisphere because there's nothing left. Um, but often a second stroke in the right hemisphere actually causes aphasia, showing us that the person had uh, the right hemisphere had taken over language so that a stroke there can cause aphasia again. Um, but we also have functional imaging studies like fMRI that show activation of additional areas during language tasks. So in this patient, um, what we see is uh, this is actually during a reading task. It shows activation in the right fusiform, not the left fusiform, even though the fusiform left fusiform area is one area on the left that was still intact, it doesn't use that area because it's not really connected to anything. Um, but instead, he's really crossed to the right hemisphere. Now, there are a number of ways people can compensate. Um, there are word 
and uh, symbol apps that people can use. Smartphones have a number of apps people can use. If they can't talk, they can select a symbol to communicate. There are many ways to convert text to speech now um, to compensate for um, reading comprehension or speech articulation problems. We can also, um, for people who can't spell, um, all of our smartphones and so on can convert our speech to text, and this can compensate for spelling uh, problems. Aphasic people often use low-tech uh, methods to communicate as well, like personalized word note books. They make uh, books that have names of all the people in their family or names of places they like to go, and they can find those uh, when they can't think of the word. Um, and aiding comprehension in people with persistent word comprehension deficits can be compensated for by using something like Google Images to retrieve a picture and show the person a picture when they don't understand the word. Now, there have been many innovative language therapies as well, including behavioral therapies that can bring about uh, improvement. Um, and one of them is speech entrainment. And this is having the person read simultaneously with another speaker. So they get both audio and visual feedback. They can often kind of mimic the other person's um, uh, mouth movements. And uh, you may have heard of mirror neurons that allow people to do this kind of thing. This can um, help people with chronic post-stroke aphasia who have difficulty with speech articulation. And it's actually been shown to double output relative to just using audio feedback. Um, and other behavioral therapies are constraint-induced language therapy, um, which has it, it consists of having the person play games or other language activities for three hours per day, and they're kind of constrained not to use other modalities to communicate. They have to um, use speech rather than uh, writing or drawing or gesturing or any of the compensatory me methods I talked about. Um, although there is no differences in outcome compared to individual therapy given twice a week, um, all of these uh, showed, all groups showed significant improvement. And this was even more so in acute stroke. Um, now, there are also technology assisted therapies. I mentioned some uh, uh, technologies before to help people communicate, but there's also ways that you can use apps to do uh, language therapy. So, for example, this is a picture naming task where they have to say zebra. If they can't think of it, they're given cues, um, and then they're uh, given uh, feedback as well. There are computer-delivered naming therapies that we've used in some of our clinical trials at SKSI. Um, and let me see if I, I'll show you those in a few minutes. Um, and then this is a nice one called Eva Park that's a virtual environment where the person sort of flies around or walks around uh, a virtual environment and they, they touch or sit on uh, things to interact with them. So if they uh, want to interact with uh, a dog, they might touch the dog and the dog would bark and they can, they're can they asked to do things with the dog. They can dance, swim or relax, um, meditate, practice ordering food in a virtual restaurant and so on. Now we've done some, uh, we're currently investigating a number of uh, therapies in the early stage after stroke, including EEG neurofeedback to improve language and post-stroke aphasia. And this is where a person be, uh, watches a movie on a screen and they have EEG electrodes and they have goals like reducing beta activity, for example, and they can't see their own EEG waves, but they're given um, positive feedback by watching this movie and it becomes clearer when they're actually reducing their beta uh, activity on their EEG and it becomes more blurred when they, they have uh, more beta activity, the opposite of their target. 
Um, we had for until the pandemic, we had an innovative program on the brain rescue unit um, that was a communal eating program that increased communication exchanges and enhanced food intake when people were sitting together having a meal, which is much more natural way to eat than having food just delivered to you in your bed. Um, it's not always safe to, to eat in bed anyway, as the person tends to be uh, leaning backwards, which is uh, not a safe way to swallow, but also allowed speech pathologists to um, monitor both their swallowing and communication exchanges. Now, another way that uh, we've at SKSI have been uh, delivering innovative therapies is through uh, our STAR car, the Stroke Treatment and Recovery car, in which therapists actually go to the person's home or even a nursing home where the person is. We have this uh, wheelchair, wheelchair accessible van and they uh, can come onto the van to get behavioral therapy and sometimes combined with transcranial direct current stimulation, which I'll show you, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And we can also evaluate uh, their activation in their brain using something called uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy. So we have this equipment on the van so we can look at areas that are activated during language and which areas are working together, that is showing increased functional connectivity as they improve. Um, so how do we enhance reorganization to improve recovery? Well, transcranial direct current stimulation is one way, and it's been, it reduces the threshold of activation of neurons in the network that's activated by a concurrent task. So it doesn't work all on its own. It doesn't cause action potentials, doesn't do anything if you just give it at rest. But if you do a language test, for example, you're activating the language network, whether it's the normal network or the reorganized network, um, and the uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, which is a non-invasive, non-painful, one to two milliamps of stimulation over healthy parts of the brain, um, it will reduce the threshold of activation. So that whole network will be activated and will be more easily activated next time you try to activate that network. And it works by a mechanism that's dependent on brain-derived uh, neurotrophic factor, um, which is important for neuroplasticity. And this has been shown in animal studies. Um, we've also shown um, in stroke studies that uh, uh, people with a, a normal BDNF uh, allele, um, which is it's a, a gene that everybody has uh, one variant, and people with the more normal variant show better response to this kind of transcranial magnetic stimulation, or transcranial direct current stimulation, I mean. There have been a number of small crossover trials, that is, people at serve as their own controls um, and they show more improvement um, with uh, their, when they get the transcranial direct current stimulation than when they get sham. But I'll tell you about a couple of uh, larger randomized control trials. Transcranial magnetic stimulation has also been used and I'll show you some evidence for that. And possibly medications that um, act on neurotransmitters um, by an increasing the availability of neurotransmitters may help with reorganization. So John Fried, uh, sorry, Julius Friedrichsen is a colleague of mine who we're working with now, and he was the PI on a, a randomized double-blind sham control study of transcranial direct current stimulation over language areas in 74 participants who had uh, post-stroke aphasia in the chronic stage. And he found that patients who were randomized to TDCS showed significantly more improvement compared to those who were randomized to sham. It was a 70% increase in correct naming for the 
anodal transcranial direct current stimulation relative to sham. Now, again, they got language therapy at the same time. Now, we uh, just finished a trial in SKSI of um, a transcranial direct current stimulation in the subacute period. We uh, wanted to do exactly the same study um, that Julius Friedrichsen had done. So we used the same um, computer deliver delivered um, language task um, as, as he used in the chronic stage, but we did this in people at, uh, who are about two months post-stroke. Um, we don't have the results yet. Um, we're still, we're, we've just closed the study, so we're getting results um, to see if it was effective or not. Um, if there was a significant difference between the sham group and the TDCS group. Um, and, but we're still blinded to these. So this is one of our patients. And so we know that she got the computer delivered language therapy. We don't know if she got um, the real therapy or the sham, uh, sham TDCS. Um, but she did get the behavioral treatment. So this is her before treatment. Oops. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you tell me what's happening in this picture? So she's just gesturing and she's pointing and kind of grunting, but she's not saying any words. She's trying to describe this picture of the woman washing dishes. Words. What? Can you tell me some words to describe what's happening? So the only word she ever says is what? Now, after therapy, sorry, let me. Um, it's, it, uh, there's a boy and girl. Um, the boy is on the stool. That, 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 so, Cookies. Uh, the girl is getting cookies. Also, the um, he looks like he's gonna fall, fall down. The there's a lady that she's doing the this this and she's um the water is running over on her. Um. So you can see she made excellent improvement, even though she still has a little bit of speech problem, she says a lot more. Um, now in Julius Friedrichsen's study, I mentioned BDNF, there was an interaction between TDCS condition and genotype for treatment related naming improvement. That is participants with the more normal VAL, VAL genotype who received anodal TDCS showed greater response to aphasia treatment than patients who showed sham, which was the main result of the study, but importantly, participants with the normal genotype showed greater response to aphasia treatment than those who had at least one met allele, which is a different genotype, regardless of whether they got TDCS um, or sham. Um, Raj Sebastian in my lab, um, who's in PMNR, um, has been carrying out cerebellar TDCS to enhance the role of the right cerebellum in language. And um, it also, we know the right cerebellum is very important in learning and short-term memory. Um, and there, she had carried out a small crossover trial in post-stroke aphasia that showed some effect, um, but a colleague of ours at Georgetown who showed, uh, who did a similar study of right cerebellar TDCS, but he only had five treatment sessions as opposed to 30 treatment sessions um, in Raj's study. Um, had, his smaller study had shown um, no effect and Raj's study had shown a positive effect. And we can see if you stimulate the right cerebellum, most of the stimulation really is generated in the uh, activation is in the right cerebellum. This is her crossover trial where everybody got TDCS um, plus therapy or sham plus therapy. 
and then there was um, a two month washout period and they crossed over and then had either sham or TDCS plus the language therapy. And what she found was both groups, people improved in both conditions on trained words, but on untrained words, they only improved when they got TDCS, not when they got sham. And the same thing um, with uh, occurred not only immediately post therapy, but two months later, the people who got the real TDCS, or I mean, the uh, after the real TDCS, there was improvement two months later. Sometimes this was after the washout period before they got, they switched to the second condition, um, but they did not maintain any improvements um, at, at two months in the uh, sham after the sham condition. Um, this is just an example. This was an interesting patient who had two internal carotid artery strokes. Um, the first stroke was in the left hemisphere and he became severely aphasic. And then he had a second stroke in the right hemisphere um, that he had recovered completely after the first stroke, but language shifted to the right hemisphere. So when he had a right internal carotid artery stroke during a second uh, carotid dissection, he became aphasic again, show, showing us that he had crossed over. Um, and he improved, his speech did not improve. He remained anarthric because of bilateral upper motor neuron uh, anarthria, but he could write in uh, sentences and that's how he communicated, but his spelling was poor. So she did a treatment study of spelling and uh, using right cerebellar TDCS. And, and it's great because that, that the cerebellum is actually, was actually one of the few areas that was completely intact, not affected by either stroke. Um, and what she found is, again, people improved in the sham condition and in the TDCS condition for trained words, but showed much less improvement for untrained words. And sorry, this person, not people. Um, and he also improved in spelling untrained words and in this untrained task of written picture naming um, with TDCS, but he did not improve in the sham condition on the untrained task. And at two month follow-up again, for trained words, we see significant improvement in spelling after both sham and TDCS, but for untrained words only in the TDCS condition and for the untrained task only in the TDCS condition. What's more, we were able to show that um, in this patient, there was increased connectivity. So this is all the areas of the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And the color shows how connected they are, functionally connected um, each area is with all the other areas. So the blue areas, there's poor connectivity. In yellow and orange areas, there's higher connectivity. And in at baseline, there was really only good connectivity between the left and right sides of the brain. Um, these are homologous areas um, of the brain. But after TDCS, you can see there's a lot more yellow areas where areas of the brain um, and the, the most strongly uh, connected areas are in red. So the, this is actually the cerebellum. So the most changes were shown between the left connectivity between the left and right cerebellum, but also the cerebellum with many of the other cortical regions shown in yellow. Um, and this is just a, compa uh, a comparison of after TDCS to before TDCS, and all the red areas are areas that showed increased connectivity. Uh, at control um, person about the same age and sex um, who showed who had no TDCS really showed no changes in connectivity um, in any of the areas. And in the subtraction, we, we don't see any red areas that showed increased connectivity. Um, so um, what about medical treatment of, uh, to augment aphasia therapy? Well, there have been a few small studies that show that cholinesterase inhibitors, which have been used for um, Alzheimer's disease, 
might show a little bit of improvement compared to placebo with therapy, but um, results have contradictory results have been found in by other investigators. Memantine is another uh, medication that's been uh, used for Alzheimer's disease and was given in a randomized control trial with the constraint induced aphasia therapy. And they found some improvement in the Western aphasia battery um, in the uh, drug group compared to placebo, but it's a very small effect size. So just a few points on the 100 point scale. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors have not been used in aphasia therapy before, but we are currently doing a randomized control trial of an SSRI plus language therapy um, versus placebo plus the same language therapy at, um, immediately post-stroke um, to see if there's an effect. One small randomized control trial just using um, looking at cognition with something, a uh, test called the R bands showed some improvement in the SSRI group compared to placebo um, in a randomized trial. Um, and we had shown just in terms of pre, uh, uh, the effects of SSRIs that um, in recovery was best in people who did not have damage to Wernicke's area in the superior temporal gyrus or the arcuate fasciculus. These were areas that were associated with poorer recovery, even after controlling for lesion volume. Um, and, but we also found in a retrospective analysis of our patients in a longitudinal study that continuous use of SSRIs in the, in the first three months of stroke was associated with uh, free, greater frequency of obtaining good improvement on the Boston naming test, 88% versus 33%. And in describing the picture, the more things that they could describe, what we call content units, um, was better in people who took SSRIs for three months compared to those who did not. Now, this was just an observational study, not a randomized trial. Um, we also found SSRI users show greater improvement than SSRI uh, non-users um, with a, a large effect size. Um, and this just shows you the two tests um, and more improvement in the SSRI users to those who had never used SSRIs. But we also found that the higher rate of improvement in SSRI uh, users could not be explained by differences in between groups and depression. In fact, the uh, SSRI uh, users were non-significantly more depressed at outcome than the non-users. And in uh, multivariable analysis, SSRI use, age, and education were all associated with improvement on the Boston naming test, but the SSRI users, SSRI use was associated with the good outcome independently of the other variables. And then we did a confirmatory study uh, that was a longitudinal observational study um, and again confirmed that damage to superior temporal gyrus or the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is also the arcuate fasciculus, was associated with the late, lower rate of achieving uh, the highest quartile of naming recovery and a very large effect size. Um, 6% versus 92%, um, as well as a uh, higher rate of achieving, uh, um, or people who had damage had a lower rate of achieving recovery on the Western aphasia battery. Um, there was no difference in SSRI use between the patients who had these lesions involving posterior superior temporal gyrus and superior longitudinal fasciculus. Um, but in multivariable analysis, damage to this uh, area was associated with lowest, lower odds of achieving, um, achieving highest outcome, even after controlling for SSRI use volume months since onset. But importantly, among those who had damage to this critical lesion, SSRI users were much more likely to achieve higher accuracy 
on object naming than non-users. So the mean difference was 86% versus 46% accurate on object naming. And those who did not have damage to this critical lesion actually achieved excellent object naming accuracy, even if they didn't receive SSRI. So really, we only may need to augment aphasia therapy in those people who have these critical lesions. Um, and this is just an example of someone who has um, damage to superior temporal gyrus and superior longitudinal fasciculus, but achieved highest quartile of object naming after taking an SSRI for three months. Um, so this SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor that's typically used as an antidepressant. Um, but this is a patient who has a smaller lesion, but it also affected both posterior superior temporal gyrus and superior longitudinal fasciculus. He did not take an SSRI and did not achieve the highest quartile of naming recovery. So in conclusion, aphasic individuals without damage to this critical, these critical areas are likely to make good recovery of naming, um, whether or not they take SSRIs, but those who have these critical lesions uh, are likely to improve only if they take SSRIs for at least three months. And so that's re really provided the impetus for our current randomized control double blind study of SSRI use plus language therapy and subacute stroke. Um, they start escitalopram or placebo immediately after stroke and take it for 90 days. And then they get a computer delivered language therapy at two months post stroke, um, all participants. Uh, and then uh, we, we look at improvement in naming and discourse, but also in depression and some motor skills, um, such as grip strength and nine hole peg. We don't know if it works yet because we've just started uh, enrolling people this year. Um, so in language recovery in acute stroke um, involves restoring blood flow, um, language gains in subacute or chronic stroke requires reorganization of structure function relationships through rehabilitation, um, including behavioral therapies, tele-rehab, mobile rehab units, and so on. But it can also be augmented by transcranial direct current stimulation or transcranial magnetic stimulation, which um, maybe Pablo uh, Selnick will be talking about because he uses that to augment rehabilitation. Um, possibly medications that um, affect neurotransmitter release or breakdown um, can also enhance neuroplasticity of the language network. And we've been evaluating that with a uh, number of different uh, imaging methods. So I just want to recognize that Funding for our, our studies mostly comes from the NIH, from NIDCD, as well as SKSI. Um, and it takes a lot of work from people in my lab, collaborators at University of South Carolina and uh, Medical University of South Carolina. Um, many of the faculty who've been in the cerebrovascular division, neuroradiology, and biostatisticians at the School of Public Health and uh, psychiatry to evaluate the effects of depression. Um, and this is just the SCORE lab, and we're trying to spell out S-C-O-R-E. Thank you very much for your time.